There are several issues in the church today that have been debated for decades and have only served to divide our congregations and alienate believers. I'm Steve Schwetz, here to welcome you aboard the Bible bus for the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible. Today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, takes us to 1 Timothy 2, where his message, Women's Place in the Local Church, takes a look at two very important factors in this age-old discussion. Number one, what the Roman world was like in Paul's day, and how mystery religions impacted his writing of this passage. And then, more importantly, number two, what Paul actually says. Over the years, Paul's words have been misquoted and miscommunicated, and also misunderstood. But Dr. McGee, never afraid to tackle such tough topics, takes us straight to 1 Timothy chapter 2 to explain the truth of the passage. Dr. McGee first gave this sermon many years ago when he was a pastor of a large church in downtown Los Angeles. And I'm pleased to say that I think that you'll find his words on this subject are as refreshing and up-to-date as anything you'll hear in the best Bible-believing churches today. Now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your timeless word that answers so many of our questions. As we listen, please open our hearts and eyes so that we may hear your truth on this matter. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our subject this evening is women's place in the local church. There are today two extreme positions relative to the place that women should occupy in the local and visible church. One position permits women to occupy a place of prominence and leadership in all public services. And among those, you find women preachers, women choir directors, women officers. In fact, there's no position in the church that is shut out to them. As a result, women are not only prominent, but they're very dominant in these groups. Oftentimes, you find among them some women are, that are indeed very capable and have very wonderful ability and you find them actually being used mightily of God. Now there's another extreme position, and it's the opposite. It shuts women out altogether from all public services. You never hear the voice of a woman in public in these meetings, not even in singing. There are two groups in particular that I have in mind because I have been called a minister uh, to these two groups from time to time. And I have found, especially in the past, that women were pushed to the background. And I feel like that that church, as one of the ministers there said to me, we've suffered a great loss in not using the talent of women that God definitely has given a certain talent and a gift to. And I told him that I always felt when I saw that, I always thought of the story about the little uh, small-town newspaper. And in this small town, uh, the, a maiden lady who was well-known died. And the society editor, who ordinarily wrote up the, the obituary notices, was sick. And so they called upon the sports editor. Uh, to write her obituary notice. And he wrote it something like this. Here lies the bones of Nancy Jones. For her life held no terror. She lived an old maid. She died an old maid. No hits, no runs, no errors. <laughs> I feel like it is tragic not to use the talent that God has given to some women, and he's definitely given them talents. But why do we have all this confusion today regarding this rather practical issue? And tonight I want us to see what the Word of God actually has to say. What was the position of the Apostle Paul actually 
not just what someone might think today, but we want to see tonight actually what he said. Now the confusion today has come about from two sources, and these are the two that I want to talk about this evening. First of all, the unfamiliarity of folk today with the Roman world of Paul's day. And the second, the uncertainty as to what Paul actually said. Now, let's go back and look at the world of Paul, the apostle. Look at this world in which he was. And may I say that I want to mention something tonight that you hear very seldom mentioned today. And that is, in Paul's day and in the Roman world of his day, there was what is known as the mystery religions. They were dominant. They had an influence on the everyday life of the average individual of that day to an extent that you and I today cannot even dream of. It's impossible to understand a great deal that Paul and the other New Testament writers had to say without a knowledge of these mystery religions. And when I wrote the little book on exploring through Ephesians, I put in the, the last chapter as an appendix a thesis that I wrote in seminary on the mystery religion, because it was a field that no one had explored. And I found, have found that today that uh, very little has been done. And I'd like tonight to mention something about these mystery religions that Paul met them on every hand, and it will explain a great deal that he has to say. Now, the mystery religions, they were an influence from 300 B.C. to 300 A.D., from Alexander the Great to Constantine in Rome. These uh, mystery religions exerted a potent influence over the life of the Mediterranean world, both the Roman, the Greek, and the Oriental. They were a dominant factor during the century that began with Augustus, saw the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and also saw the ministry of the great apostle Paul. And that century ended with Domitian. This was the period when the cult of the ruler, because it was a time when the ruler himself was exalted, made into a god, and in many cases worshipped. Leg, the, uh, the uh, scholar, very scholarly historian, has said concerning the mystery religions in this period, he says there has probably been no time in the history of mankind when all classes were more given over to the thought of religion. And it was during this period here. The hero, as Dr. Oss says, the hero is less honored than the saint. The religious movement puts its seal upon the century. Now, these mystery religions were very much like, uh, well, it's, they were sort of a combination between a secret lodge and the Playboy Club. They were sort of a key club of that day, uh, sort of, but combined with religion. And immorality was wedded to religion in these mystery religions. Women were very prominent in them, as we shall see. Now, some of the great men of the past were members of the mystery club. Herodotus and Postanius, both of these outstanding writers were. Socrates was chided because he would not join one of them. Pindar, in his odes that he wrote, he was a member of the Orphic cult, and he did all of his poetry under mystic influence. Plutarch, Aristides, and Julian the Apostate were members of the mysteries. They came about largely because the Roman world had come in contact with the East. And you have the bringing together of that which was bad in both, and the wedding of them through the Greek philosophy and through Greek religions. And actually, that was the bankruptcy of Greek religion. Alexander the Great had scattered all of this 
throughout the Roman world, the Mediterranean world. And the, um, the uh, mysteries appeal to the emotions rather than to the intellect. It is Aristotle that called attention to that. They were a sort of a secret order, as we've said, a sort of a lodge that you join. And even to this day, they do not know a great deal of the secret rites that went on in them. However, we do know certain things about them. Uh, for instance, they always had a female deity somewhere in the mystery and somewhere in the initiation. Gross immorality was in it, and they seemed to pick out some heathen deity, some uh, goddess, and then they took all the attributes of the other goddesses and attributed it to theirs. Here is an example of this in one of the mystery religions that they found. Isis of a thousand names, parent of nature, mistress, mistress of all the elements, the firstborn of the ages, whom the Phrygians adore as the Pisanutian mother of the gods, the Athenians as Minerva, the Cyprians as Venus, the Cretans as uh, Dictinian Diana, the Sicilians as per uh, Perserpenta, and the Aleutians as Demeter, others as Juno or Bellana, others Hecate or Ramnusia, while the Egyptians and others honor me with my proper name of Queen Isis. Now, there were three mysteries, and I'd like to mention these because we do know something about them. They were like three secret orders. The first and the most prominent was the Eleusinian mysteries. They began in Eleusis, the Greek city, but before long it spread out, and even the Emperor Augustus was a member of the Eleusinian mysteries. They had a great uh, lodge or temple in the city of Rome. Marcus Aurelius was a member of this. Uh, Cicero paid a great compliment to it, and it was probably the highest of all of them. And yet they engaged in some of the most uh, satanic and diabolic orgies that are imaginable. The one that was probably the worst one of all was the cult of Dionysius. And it's been called the crudest, and the most immoral of all the Greek mysteries. Plato criticized it. He says it's an immortality of drunkenness. It seemed to be considered the Dionysian reward of virtue. And women were in the majority. And if you'd like to know something about the initiation, here's how horrible it was. If you wanted to join this mystery, why, you went through a certain ritual to a major application, and if you were accepted, you were brought in for the initiation. You were, uh, had a robe put on you. You were taken down uh, into a sort of a tunnel. Above you was a lattice work, and that would be driven up on top of you, a, a live bull. That live bull would be slain. You would remove your garment. Both men and women were put there. They were in the nude, and as that live bull was slain, you let the blood, you'd hold your head up, let the blood run into your eyes, your ears, your nostrils, and then you'd drink it. They always said that that changed you, and I can well understand that it brought about quite a change to go through an initiation like that. You can talk about the, the fraternities putting on initiations today. You can imagine what this did. This was part of it. Then before that bull died, the women that were members of this cult, they were adorned, and they all made a rush for this bull, and before it died, they began to bite its flesh, and they would eat it raw. Absolutely, sometimes they would consume, there'd be enough of them there that would consume the entire animal. May I say to you, that was the mystery religions of Paul's day, and that was the one that was very prominent in the area that Paul went in Asia Minor and in Greece. Now, the other one was the one with, uh, with which he came in contact probably 
more than any other was the one known as the Great Mother. And you can talk about perversion as it's revealed in modern literature, but the cult of the Great Mother who loved the shepherd boy at it is without doubt one of the most corrupt of all of them. It was the one that was very popular in the Roman Empire. In fact, the Ides of March that Caesar was warned against was a celebration of the Great Mother cult. It was on the 24th of March, and it was a celebration, a day of blood. A drunken orgies always took place, and if you'll notice Paul in this passage talked uh, several times about women being sober, Christian women. You see, they were drunk. It was an awful drunken orgy, all of these cults. And this one was the one that Paul met in Ephesus. When he went there and they gathered in the, in the amphitheater and were about to mob him, when they all said, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. That's the cult of the great mother. That's one of the mystery religions of the Roman Empire. Now it's with that background and with people steeped in that sort of thing that Paul moves into the Roman Empire and preaches the gospel, and now he tells women how they are to act when they go into public worship. And you can well understand, now I bl at least I trust you can, some of the things that he's saying. Now I want us to look at this chapter now and let's see that... Uh, what Paul meant. Not only is there an unfamiliarity with the Roman world of Paul's day, but there is an uncertainty as to what Paul actually said. And I would remind you of this. The man who wrote uh, in such a glowing terms of the ministry of women, you may be sure of one thing, he did not uh, relegate them to the limbo of the law are to a place of ignominy in the church. He never would have done a thing like that. You remember when he sent the letter to Rome, he said he sent it by Phoebe, and he said, I want you to receive her. She's a deaconess in the church, if you please, uh, here in Sancria, and I want you to receive her. This is the one that when he wrote to the Philippians, no doctrine to straighten out, but women were prominent in that church. He says, I beseech you, Odious and Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And then he says, help those women who help me in the gospel, so that women occupied a great place. And then again and again, he reminds them, Tryphena, Tryphosa, who labored in the Lord. And you will find that of the, of the believers that Paul mentioned, that a majority of them are actually women who are taking a prominent place in the church. We need to keep that in mind. We need to keep in mind the background out of which this man is speaking. Now, in chapter 2, he's talking about public worship, if you please. When the church comes together, what it's to do. Now, he's talking in particular here about uh, prayer. Will you listen to him? He says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. When the church comes together, we ought to pray for the world, you see, and not pray around the world, but just pray for the world, for kings and for all that are in authority. And this morning, you heard Mr. Rowe here, remember the president, and even he remembered the governors this morning. And I thought that he'd get down and remember the mayor and the council this morning, but he didn't. But maybe he'll get to them next time. But may I say to you, we are to pray uh, for these that are in authority. We ought, to, uh, we ought to pray for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now he mentions... Therefore, that prayers are to be made when the church comes together. Now he says that both men and women are to pray publicly, if you please. Now he tells how each sect is to pray. First of all, he says here, I will, therefore, and the word will is a little too strong. Bulo my, the way Paul uses it, 
means actually here, I desire. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And holy hands means hands that are uh, dedicated to God. If you're going to pray with your lips, your hands ought to be dedicated to God. Holy hands, those that are set aside for God. Lift up holy hands. And may I say to you, I know that our Pentecostal friends have sort of majored on this business of holding up hands. I wish they hadn't, because I'd like to introduce it. I think it would be a wonderful way of praying, to tell the truth. Uh, hands and the mouth, both dedicated to God. It's a good custom, by the way, and it has scriptural sanction, by the way. Uh, the hand, in other words, the life and the lip are to be saying the same thing. A hands dedicated to God. Now, with my hands dedicated to God, with my lips, Paul says the man now can pray, and I want them to pray that way. And he says without wrath, and that is we are not to pray uh, with a bad disposition. This word for wrath is the same kind of wrath God has, but we can't have it like he has. If you and I get angry like that, it's, we, we are vindictive, and we should never pray like that. And, and doubting. And actually, doubting means disputing. Uh, we should never pray a horizontal prayer. A prayer should be per perpendicular. You don't pray to answer somebody. Have you ever heard anybody pray that? I heard the story about Dwight L. Moody, that one time they called on a brother to pray, and he, uh, they had the different denominations together, and he was talking to the other denomination. And so uh, Dwight L. Moody said to him, says, Brother, open your eyes. You're preaching. <laughs> you see, there are, there's a lot of praying today that's really preaching. It's not praying at all. And that's what Paul says here. I want man to hold up hands dedicated to God without wrath, not a vindictive prayer. You're not praying now because you're moved by some wrong spirit, and you're not to do it to pray at somebody, you're not through disputings at all. Now, that's the way men are to pray. Now, Paul says women are to pray, and they're to pray publicly. Where did this idea arise that women are not to pray in public? Uh, he's, he doesn't say that at all. And somebody says, but he says in 1 Corinthians 15 that women are to keep silent in the church, only about talking in tongues. That's all. He just says women are not to talk in tongues in the church. And if you stop that... That movement would die in Southern California in a week. It just wouldn't uh, live. But Paul is merely talking about that. He didn't say women are not to speak in the church. Now, will you notice this? In like manner, also, now let's put in what Paul always intended. In like manner, also, I desire that women pray. This is the way they are to pray. They to are adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, they are to adorn themselves. You may be interested to know that the word for adorn here is the Greek word kosmain. Does that remind you of any word that you've heard? The Greek word is kosmain, and we get by actually transliteration the word cosmetic. So any of you ladies that say the Bible doesn't say you're to use cosmetic, Paul definitely says, in like manner, I desire also that women pray using cosmetics. That's the word. They are to adorn themselves. Now, that raises a question, does it not? Uh, I believe that God intended all of us to look the very best that we can, and I think it's tragic when a Christian gets to the place that they want to look and feel like that they're being pious, that they look shabby. God wants us to look the best we can with what we've got, and I think that we ought to adorn it and improve it as much as we can, frankly. It seems hopeless in some cases, but even then, I think that we ought to do the best that we can with what we've got. Uh, 
I know that it was many years ago at Dallas Seminary, this thing got into the, uh, uh, the minds of the wives of the students there. They, each woman tried to see which could look shabbier than the other. And the shabbier you look, the more pious you were. Well, there was someone around there, I'm confident that they hadn't combed their hair in a week. And, uh, boy, you couldn't tell what was up there uh, uh, when you'd look at them. Finally, Dr. Chaffer called all the wives in, and he really gave them a talking to. He said, this is not piosity, this is nonsense, and you're disgracing the Lord when you dress like this. God wants a Christian to look the best that he possibly can. Now, you see in those mystery religions, these women adorn themselves like a Cartesian. And now God says, I want God's women I want them to, to adorn themselves, but not like that. I want them to adorn themselves in modest apparel. And the word modest is the word again, cosmion. And uh, what you have is this, that I want them to adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. And the word shamefacedness actually doesn't mean that, that at all. There's no uh, idea of shame in this at all. It really means with godly fear and sobriety. All of the mystery religions, the women were drunk, and they took a prominent part. They were loud and boisterous. Uh, Paul says, I want Christian women, when they come in, I want them to pray pu publicly. I don't intend for them to take a back seat. But I do want them, when they pray, I want them to do it with modest apparel, uh, adorning themselves with modest apparel, not like a Cartesian, but to look the very best that they possibly can, of course. Uh, I think that it's just as bad, probably, to be overdressed as it is underdressed. Some wag says, the practically nothing my wife has to wear fills all three closets plus one that we share. Uh, a great many women don't think that they have anything to wear, and they seem to have a great deal to wear. But God says here that they are to adorn themselves with modest apparel. And again, you will find that Paul's talking when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11:6. For if the woman be not covered, well, let me move back to verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, what is Paul is talking about again is, he says, I want a woman, when she comes in to pray publicly, I want her head to be covered. Why? Because in those mystery religions, and right in the city of Corinth, there was that temple to Diana, or a temple to Venus, and in it were a thousand vestal virgins who, who, who were nothing more nor less than prostitutes. It was religion. And uh, in the name of our immorality, in the name of religion. And these women all had disheveled hair, drinking, carousing. Now Paul says, now, and many of them were con converted. Paul says, now, I want you to be the object from that. I want you to be able with your dress to give a testimony to the world that you have been converted. And therefore, I want you to do it with godly fear and sobriety, not with broided hair. Braided hair is the way it is. And by the way, that identified the cults always was the way the women fixed their hair. And our gold, our pearls are costly array. In other words, they were to be the opposite from uh, that which represented the mystery religions of that, of that day. But which becometh women professing godliness with good work. Now, what he's getting at is simply this. He's talking now about the inner adornment. Uh, Christian women are not to look or act like the women of the mystery religion, 
but they are to be adorned. They, Paul makes it very clear here, they adorn themselves in modest apparel. I think that you can be, uh, some, somebody says, well, I don't think a woman ought to dress in the latest style. Well, why not? If she dresses in an old Mother Hubbard and walks down the street, she sure will attract attention. I'll tell you that. You couldn't attract attention any more than dressing like that today. May I say to you that the woman should dress in the latest style, but Paul is getting over the point here that Christian women are to dress modestly in the latest style, but that their adornment actually is to be on the inside. If I may put it like this, and I'd like to turn and read first what Peter says in his epistle, and he was a married man. We're not sure about Paul, but Peter was. Listen to Peter. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, he's talking about a woman married to an unsaved man. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, listen to this. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great pride. Now he's talking about an inward adornment. And that's what Paul is talking about, that you're to be adorned on the inside. If I may bring it right up to date, Paul is saying, and so is Peter, Christian women should not look like Elizabeth Taylor on the outside. They should look like Elizabeth Taylor on the inside. That's where you're to have beauty. That's where you're to be attractive is on the inside. And I think one of the most tragic things today is to meet an attractive woman who is as vacant and as empty as a person can possibly be. That is without doubt one of the most tragic things today. That is the thing that's causing a great many talented people, uh, gifted people from Europe to leave Hollywood and to return. Uh, one man who left some time ago, a writer, made the statement he'd never met so many people with vacant minds and beautiful bodies in all of his life. And I think that that is a thing that can affect Christians today. We can put the emphasis on the outside. There needs to be an adorning on the inside, my beloved. I love camellias. Uh, down in Texas, I never could raise them. I had to raise roses. And roses have a wonderful odor, and they're beautiful. But when I came out here, I fell in love with camellias. I think they're the most beautiful flower that there is. But you know, a camellia does have, has no odor whatsoever. And I go out, as I went out yesterday morning, I cut some, my wife wanted some for the table, and I went out and cut some camellias. And I took one of those great, big, lovely, open flowers, and I looked at it, and I said, you're just like some women I know. You're beautiful on the outside, but you've got no odor whatsoever. Nothing else. Just a shell, and that is all. Now, Paul is talking about Christian women having something on the inside. Now, Paul, uh, Peter goes on to tell about, and I think this is quite interesting as he's talking here to Jewish women, he talks to them about uh, the fact that uh, Sarah, let me turn to that because I don't want to pass that by, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Sarah obeyed Abraham. Have you read Genesis lately? May I say to you, if you read Genesis, you'll find out that Abraham did practically everything that Sarah suggested. She was a beautiful person. She was beautiful on the inside, and she was beautiful on the outside. can't read this story and come to any other conclusion than that. And so Sarah had a great influence on Abraham. But you see, she took the place a place and a marvelous place of subjection, which actually you will find that she is his helpmate in leading and in guiding him in many of the decisions that he made. 
Now let me move on here. Paul says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now we move into another area altogether. Paul says they're to pray in public, and there are other ministries they have, but when it comes to the area of doctrine, Paul says, I want women to stay out of this partic particular section. And it's no accident, therefore, that for 1,900 years there has never been an outstanding theologian who's been a woman. But did you know that women, when they've taken their place, have had the greatest influence on men. John Wesley, I'm confident, was put into the ministry by a woman. I'm confident that Abelard, and you can't read the life of Abelard without knowing that in the background there was Heloise, a wonderful Christian woman who influenced his life. You can't help but do that. But God says this is one area I want women to stay out of. And again, you can see that Paul was wise. Practically all the cults today were founded by women. Madame Blavatsky and Madame Bizant started Theosophy out of Chicago and with the help of India. And uh, you find that uh, Mary Baker, Patterson, Glover, Fry, Eddy started Christian Science. It's quite interesting that the Fox sisters started spiritually. It's interesting that women have been the founders or they are wrapped into this matter of the cults today. It's no accident, therefore, that Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach, that is, to come into the place of doctrine, or to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Not be silent in the sense not say anything, but silence in the sense that she is not to usurp authority over the man. Now, this is a question of headship. It's a question of authority. Now, someone must have the authority, and, and Paul says that in the home, in the church, in the business world, in a corporation, in the government today, there must be somebody who's at the head. Now, Paul says that the, the man is to be at the head. For Adam, he says, was first formed, then Eve, by priority of creation. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived, and this word, uh, the last word for deceived, is the same word with a preposition. And actually, if you want that brought up today, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was really taken in. He was really sold a bill of goods by Satan. She was the one who was grossly deceived. She was in the transgression. That makes a suggestion. I do not have time to develop it or dwell on it tonight at all. And that is that when Eve sinned, she was deceived. But when Adam sinned, he was not deceived. He did it deliberately. He knew what he was doing. He had a choice. He could either walk out of, uh, he could either walk out of that garden with Eve in sin, take his place by her side, or he could stay in the garden of love and bid her goodbye. He chose to go with her. I like that because I have a Savior that did the same thing. He could have stepped out of this world. He was without sin. He said, no man taketh my life from me. No one could touch him. He did not have to die. He did not have to go to the cross. But because he loved me, he took my place, and he took your place, and he died for you, and he died for me. That's the picture of Adam and Eve, if you please. Paul is saying that here. It's a beautiful picture. And that's the reason that Paul turns around and now says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And Christ loved the church as Adam loved Eve. Will you notice now, for I must close. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with sobriety. Now, Paul is saying this. This is one of the most difficult verses to deal with. It looks as if Paul is saying that a woman can be saved by bearing children. 
He's not saying that at all. He says, notwithstanding, he shall be saved, and it's the Greek word uh, preposition dia, through childbearing. Now, this is what he means. He means simply this. He says, I've given you the illustration of Adam and Eve. And you'll recall that when Eve sinned, one of the things that God said to Eve was, in sorrow you'll bring forth children. Now, Paul says, that curse is not removed. And she'll still bring forth children in sorrow when she's a Christian. But she's saved through childbearing, even though she suffers. Even though she travail, she'll be saved, not by this, but through this, my beloved. And though the curse of Eve still be upon her, when she bears a child, she's still saved. She's still saved. Just as you have to go out today and earn your living by the sweat of your brow, that curse has not been removed when you become a child of God. Chances are you have to work harder than you ever did before. And a woman who's a Christian may even suffer more than any other bearing children. But she's saved. And that's all that Paul is saying here. Then he says that the thing that's important is not, the if here is not a condition in view of the fact that they continue in faith and love and holiness. And he says it again, the final word with sobriety. Now, Paul is saying, I want women in the church to have a part. I want them actually to lead in prayer publicly, but I don't want them to be like the women in the mystery religion. I don't want them to be drunken. I don't want them to have disheveled hair. I don't want them to be dressed like a Cartesian. But he's not saying that they're not to be in style. He's not to say that they're not to have a part. He says that women have a very definite place as men have a definite place. And when women take that place, God certainly honors them in the ministry today, the ministry that he's given to them. We've seen today that God intended women to have a definite place in the local church according to his design and plan. Though today's sermon may not have answered all your questions, and we know that there are honest differences of opinion, don't forget that God's Word is our final authority. So if you'd like to spend a little more time studying this passage, Dr. McGee's message is available to you for purchase on an individual CD or printed booklet, or available for free download as an e-booklet. Just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit our website, ttb.org or shop our online bookstore, or browse our large selection of e-booklet downloads. Click on the Resources tab at the top of the page to get started. And if you're visiting us at ttb.org, be sure to check out the section called Bible in Your Language, brought to you through a ministry partnership with our friends at Faith Comes by Hearing. Through the Bible is excited to offer your access to both audio and text versions of the Bible in hundreds of languages. And maybe even more helpful to you is the link to the Bible.is app, available for both Apple and Android mobile devices. The Bible.is app offers the audio Bible and text for anyone in the world in their own heart language. So if you'd like to share God's Word with a family member or friend, no matter what language they speak or where they live, share the link to the Bible.is app. That address again is ttb.org. That's ttb.org and click on the Bible in Your Language button. As you continue to support this ministry through your prayers and financial support, we hope that you're receiving our monthly newsletter for updates on the ongoing work of this ministry around the world. To be placed on our mailing list, call us at 1-865-BIBLE, visit our website, or write to us at Through the Bible Radio, Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Be sure to join us this week as Dr. McGee expands our study of 1 Timothy beginning in chapter 1, verse 3. Now I pray that God will fill you with His grace, mercy, and peace until we meet again. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.